rifampin versus rifapentine, which is most totally good. All right. So just a few uh, uh, summary per parameters about rifampin. Uh, it's a primary drug, as you know, uh, and it's used with isoniazid. You know the mechanism of action. It's available virtually in all countries. It has a molecular weight of 823. Uh, the standard dose that we use is 600 milligrams. I think everyone here now uh, understands that, oh, uh, that the dose is probably too small, and it may move as high as 2,400 milligrams, though that's not determined yet. Um, at steady state, the drug has a very short half-life of about two hours, so that is a shortcoming of it. And the toxicities that we, wow, these mics are really uh, highly sensitive to exactly how close I stand. Um, the hepatotoxicity and uh, flu-like syndrome are the things that we worry about. So. Rifampin, if I can get the mouse to do what it's supposed to do, has a pithy little methyl group here as the end of this particular portion of the molecule, and that's where the difference is with rifapentine. Right? These are the serum concentrations, and I could pick anything between 8 to 24 and would be a reasonable peak concentration for uh, rifampin. In this particular uh, slide, I have a peak of 9, and then in the red, I have the free drug concentration, which is roughly 15% of uh, the, the peak concentration uh, total. Turning to rifapentine, uh, to my knowledge, it's only uh, approved for use in uh, the United States, though that could change with, you know, fair, fairly small barriers to overcome. Um, larger molecular weight, and the, the main distinguishing feature is it's 99% protein bound. Different methods have anywhere to, from 97 to 99 and a half, but I think 99 is a good summary value. Um, and, and again, the dose is moving from the initial 600 milligrams uh, to 1,200 milligrams. Uh, structurally, it's got this big donut here uh, where the methyl group was on rifampin. So otherwise, you know, uh, the business end of the molecule, what people might call the warhead, is identical between rifampin and rifapentine. It's just this side chain, and then when you put a big lipophilic side chain on a molecule, again, if I can get the mouse to work, then you're going to change its characteristics, and in this case, um, it makes it hydrophobic, and so when it's in the plasma, it sticks to things like albumin. So if we look at the concentrations, they are proportionally higher than you see with rifampin, maybe a third, maybe a quarter, depending on the data you look at. Uh, but the free drug concentrations are rather low, so I'll change the scale so you get a better look at it. Uh, and so the free drug concentrations, they hang around longer than rifampins, uh, but they're considerably lower. So what we have here is a tail of two Ferraris with different tails. So maybe you like the short tail Ferrari or maybe you like the long tail Ferrari. Um, in either case, if you, even if you prefer the short tail and you were told you had to use the long tail, you still got a Ferrari, right? You know, so it's just not so bad. And it's even better if someone else is paying for the Ferrari, right? All right, so if we look at any of the parameters, and I'm going to focus on Cmax because I think this is where the two differentiate. Um, if you just look at the total drug concentrations, clearly rifapentine seems to be the winner because it is a, a MIC that's anywhere between half down to a quarter of that of, of rifampin. It has a somewhat higher uh, Cmax. And so the ratio of the Cmax to the MIC total drug concentration is much in favor of rifapentine and it has a longer half-life. So it seems to have it beat both ways. But wait, there's more. If you look at the free drug concentrations, then this is the one place that rifampin may have the advantage. And if we think about what that means, the free drug concentration is actually the gradient which drives the drugs into the lesions where the organisms are hiding. So you might think that this could be an advantage for rifampin. So what's the culprit? The culprit is albumin, which is a very big molecule, uh, molecular weight on the order of 70,000. Um, and this is uh, its a Shirley Temple look um, in this particular uh, depiction. And it's about 80 times the size of rifapentine. So what does that look like? It looks like this, right? So here's albumin, the big aircraft carrier, and we have the little rifapentine stuck to it. And albumin is so big, you could have even more than one rifapentine stuck to it, though we don't actually know that that's what happens in the, in the body. But the problem is, the aircraft carrier can't go all the way into all harbors. It can't go up rivers or streams, okay? So albumin is not going to get pulled into a mycobacterium where rifapentine needs to do its work. So the rifapentine has to come off of the albumin to get into the, the place and inside of the mycobacterium. So as long as it's stuck to the aircraft carrier, that's not going to happen. 
So everyone knows this slide from the JRM study in 2003, looking at the AUC to MIC, and I believe this is total drug AUC and not free drug AUC, um, but I'd have to go back and double check that. But the point here is that the, uh, the R squared value is 0.95, which is a very high correlation. So clearly this seems to be the best predictor of the drop in the CFUs in this uh, six-day acute mouse model but only slightly less well-known, is that the CMAX to MIC also had a very high correlation. And if we at least look at the, the, the free drug ratios that I presented uh, earlier for rifampin, they would put it on this part of the slide. And when you think about it, rifampin actually does work pretty well. If we look at the AUC again, it really puts it at the 600 milligram dose in almost the non-effective range. It might be underselling what you know, rifampin actually does. So at least here, the CMAX seems to be at least down the slope a little bit. But the point here is that even in the data that Dr. Svensson presented earlier this morning, we can actually get into this kind of ratio range with the, the high doses of rifampin. So you could buy yourself an additional two log drop in this particular model. So you know, there is actually something to the idea of these high dose rifampin uh, approaches. If we look at the time above MIC, it doesn't seem to be nearly as well correlated. So this is not the parameter upon which you probably want to optimize this drug, So which takes me to my point. If it's clearly related to AUC to MIC or CMAX to MIC and not really that well linked to time above MIC, what's the rationale for a long half-life drug which optimizes time above MIC? So if we look at some of the, the data from Martin Borey and Rob's work, um, you could see that they got a more than proportional increase in CMAX and more than proportional <coughs> increase in AUC as they escalated the doses in this CROI presentation up to 35 milligrams per kilogram, and we saw further this morning up to 40. And in the publication that came out in the Blue Journal, uh, they showed that doses on the order of 2,400 milligrams uh, could be used safely, and it was more than proportional increases as mentioned, and here's the publication. And there was high inter-individual variability, which is one of my pet peeves about using drugs. Um, and there's roughly 40-fold variability with the rifamycin, depending on the study data that you look at. So it suggests that you might want to control that. Uh, the greatest reduction is clearly linked to the highest AUCs. And then Dr. Savic could speak to these data on this slide quite well, because she did the analysis. Um, you know, the similar thing is seen with rifapentine. High exposures, AUC, were associated with greater degrees of sputum sterilization, um, but there were less than proportional increases in uh, the rifapentine concentrations. So to truly answer which is best, you would really need to do a study which included escalating doses of both of the drugs. Whether that study will come forward or not is a separate question. But otherwise, without that kind of head-to-head -head dose escalation study, it's really going to be hard to answer that. And it doesn't keep us from arguing and yelling about it, but I don't think we can really answer it. Uh, and finally, what were these guys doing with these flashy things? Oh, those are tracer bullets. So they were using visually guided dosing of lead, even back in 1945. Because the guys you shoot, that you're shooting at are shooting back at you, and they are trying to kill you, right? So these guys knew that it's only the bullets that hit the targets that actually work. Spraying the tree line really does nothing, right? So early TDM back in 1945, and this is from the movie Fury. So I'd like to thank the folks in my lab that really do the hard work um, and uh, the graduate students and the pre-pharmacy students who've been working on data sets. And Kelly, you look like you need a beer.